coming up on Podcast 1949. Elon Musk talks Cybertruck with Joe Rogan. Toyota admit their EV investment has been lacking. And BMW gets a step closer to their next-gen batteries. Plus, stay tuned, because later in the show, I'll tell you which country just put the Ford F-150 Lightning on sale for buyers outside of the US. But first, Hyundai's Arnic 6 is seeing some big price discounts for the next model year in the US. Base model Arnic 6 SE standard range, that's a small battery, now 38615. Remember that number for what we compare it to. That's a reduction of $4,100 from the 2023 model. Now, this model features a single motor rear wheel drive along with a small battery, 53 kilowatt hours. That's 240 miles of EPA range. But the SE's longer range price with the bigger battery is 43565 That's next year's model year, and that is a $3,050 discount compared to what you'll pay today. Now, that long-range SE model comes with a 77.4 kilowatt-hour battery pack, and that then becomes consistent across all the other Ionic 5, sorry, Ionic 6 trims, uh, delivering 361 miles of range. The Ionic 6, definitely a competitor to the Model 3 in terms of price, base price at least, compared to a standard range or whatever they call it these days, just Tesla Model 3. The current US starting price for that is $40,630, but that qualifies for the $7,500 EV tax credit, which the Hyundai doesn't, and that could be a deal breaker. Next, we'll talk Elon Musk dropping into the Joe Rogan show. This is the fourth time he's done that and giving us a few Cybertruck insights. Well, no, actually, no, not really. Nothing he said is what we haven't heard before. It wasn't quite an Elon greatest hits set, which some of the earnings calls can be. He complained about how hard it is to make things and how prototypes are easy and mass production is hard. He took the Cybertruck on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast and Rogan tested the durability of it by shooting it with his bow and arrow. Here is what they said, though, about the weight and performance. How much does the Cybertruck weigh? Uh, it depends on configuration, but it's about uh, 7,000 pounds. Whoa. We're aiming to get the 0 to 60 below 3 seconds. Below 3? Yes. So that acceleration target was previously set for the Trimotor variant during the launch back in 2019. Mr. Musk revised the annual production down to 200,000 Cybertrucks, but again, that wasn't even guidance for 2024. It was a little bit woolly. It was... A casual conversation really on a podcast and so that is different to the 250,000 that he formally talked about on the recent earnings call. Either way, the official specs are going to be unveiled at the delivery event on November 30th, which personally I hadn't seen clarified. I knew we had the 30th of November in the diary, but I didn't know whether maybe the day before or the week before we'd get some specs as either release or something. But from what he said on the podcast, it was everything is going to be on that day. He talked about how they're going to have some demonstrations like shooting it with the gun. I think they're going to use this one as well as part of it. So pre-recorded. They, therefore, it's under control, not throwing anything at any windows and being surprised live on stage. So more of a controlled environment. But by the sounds of it, that event is definitely confirmed. And I assumed as much is when we'll get all the specs and all the pricing. Staying with Tesla and a recent jury verdict sided with Tesla, dismissing claims that the autopilot software caused a fatal accident. The lawsuit was initiated in the Superior Court of California, County of Riverside, by two crash survivors from a 2019 incident. Now, the plaintiffs claimed Tesla's product was flawed and sought $400 million in damages for injuries, but also there was loss of life as well. Tesla maintained human error, not autopilot, led to the death of of the driver. Now, the company's defense is consistent with its position in similar lawsuits related to autopilot, and others are on the way. It's pending in California, also Tesla under investigation by both state and federal authorities concerning the safety of autopilot and its enhanced version full self-driving. Tesla, I see sort of certain Tesla websites and blogs and stuff saying that this was a, a win for Tesla, a triumph. It, it wasn't. Somebody lost their life. There's no winners in this case. But what I think it could be interesting, if we have to take something from this, is that it could be an indicator about how the legal process treats autopilot and full self-driving, whether or not Elon Musk over or under promised, and let's face it, he over-promised on what that system would do and the timelines he gave.
Let's stay with Tesla and talk about how the UAW president, Sean Fain, is setting his sights on Tesla's Fremont facility next. Uh, it's 20,000 workers there after the big win over the big three in Detroit over Ford, GM and Stellantis. Now an active UAW organizing committee at the Fremont plant appears to be now underway, although individuals didn't want to be named in this article personally. Uh, they're discussing collective bargaining benefits with fellow employees. The union is determined to allocate whatever resources is needed for this campaign. Bringing Tesla under the UAW will not only boost membership, but also enhance the union's influence as we move towards electric vehicles. Elon Musk, known for his anti-union stance, will definitely be a foe to the UAW president, who is also looking at Tesla, Toyota and Honda, and not calling them competitors or enemies, but simply members of the future. Now, public sentiment is increasingly pro-union in the US, with approval ratings for labor unions jumping from 50% back in 2016 to two-thirds. Now, the trend towards unionization has grown with companies like Amazon, Apple, Starbucks, another one that comes to mind, uh, seeing increasing organizing efforts and workers citing inflation, subpar work environments, and income disparity as reasons to unionize. How will that affect the move to electric vehicles and the cost that we pay for cars, but also the fair wage that everyone who builds those deserves? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Next up, staying on the subject of the strikes, Stellantis had their earnings call last night and they revealed on that that they anticipate the pay hikes and the impact of profitability over the strikes to be less than 750 million euros. That's 795 million dollars. Among the Detroit three automakers, Stellantis foresees at least the least financial impact from the strikes. In the third quarter, July to September, uh, their net revenue was up 7%, 45.1 billion euros net revenue, surpassing the 43.7 billion euros predicted by certain Reuters analysts. Now, Stellantis recently unveiled their commercial vehicle strategy to tackle Ford Pro, and they showed off their forthcoming cheaper city cars for Europe under €20,000 here. So, uh, a big company and lots to do with electrification, but seemingly affected less by the recent strikes than their competitors. If you love the podcast, by the way, in audio form, we're also going to put it on YouTube again. I used to do this all the time, and then I fell out of the habit and just it got really busy. And this is it's more time consuming to do video, and I have no one to help me doing this. If you're watching the video version because you discovered it on YouTube, where well, there's almost 2,000 episodes in the audio back catalogue, point your podcast player to EV News Daily and fill your boots. Now let's talk a Ford F-150 Lightning, prepping for its launch at the end of November in Switzerland. The electric truck is no longer just for the US market, but after a launch in Norway earlier this year, we now see some of Ford's electric trucks climbing up the Alps. Orders for the F-150 Lightning will be open from November, well, this month, the end of this month, I think, in Switzerland, available in the upscale Lariat variant and featuring the spacious uh, Super Crew cab, double cab body. It's got all-wheel drive, obviously. It's 20-inch wheels, and it's got the antimatter blue metallic paint. It's priced at a mere 127,000 Swiss francs, bearing in mind that a franc is worth just less than a US dollar. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's a slightly pricey vehicle, but still cool that we now have them both here in Norway and Switzerland here in Europe. If Ford want to make some right-hand drive versions and, uh, and, and sell them here in the UK, well, I wouldn't complain. Okay, next, let's talk extreme fast charging pouch cells for future EVs. Not as far off as sometimes we think about these things that we hear about batteries and cells in the lab. This is the Israeli company StoreDot. Now, they previously achieved 1,000 cycles at 80% original capacity with their production-ready pouch cells. That was last October a year ago, independently verified then in December as of last year. Now, while previous tests were under standard lab conditions, these new tests they've done have been aiming to replicate real-world scenarios. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. The cells were charged at varying rates. They slow charged them, or sort of equivalent level 2 AC charging them, 0 to 10%, as you probably would at home. Then they rapid charged them 10 to 80. So if you are on a road trip and you are using these cells, uh, over, charging them over and over again, you'll probably, most people, and I know that everyone's different, just say you pull into a DC fast charger at 10% because you've got a comfortable buffer and you charge to 80 because when it starts to slow down and then you get back on the road. Then they slow charge them from 80 to 100%. Even when 70% of the cell was charged rapidly within 10 minutes, they saw no extra wear 
compared to slower charging them on what is effectively level 2 AC charging. Now, StoreDot collaborates with companies like Mercedes-Benz, Volvo, uh, Polestar, Ola, Electric in there as well. And these cells, as of earlier this year, maybe the right end of last year, went out to 15 of their global automotive uh, partners and to start putting these into test vehicles and actually driving them on the roads in, well, we don't know, we'd be able to camouflage vehicles or mules or things like that, but to actually give them real-world testing, not in the lab, but really good news that these extreme fast-charging batteries, which they're talking about 100 miles of range in five minutes, and that's Gen 1 of these batteries. They've got, obviously, a roadmap to get quicker uh, will be very fast charging, but very, very durable. Great news. Next, BMW gave us a really good insight into their strategy for their Gen 6 Neuklas platform and the cells that go inside them, unveiling the Cell Manufacturing Competence Center. That's the CMCC in Pastorf, close to Munich in Germany. That will produce cylindrical cells for BMW's Gen 6 batteries, and that will power the, as I said, the upcoming Neuklas EVs from 2025. BMW's present generation uses prismatic cells. The shift to cylindrical cells is a special mix that they are working on of engineering, supply chain, manufacturing knowledge, and bringing all those things together. The Battery Cell Competence Center is where they make them. The recipe, if you like, is formulated somewhere else. And that is another part of BMW's uh, arsenal, if you like. So they work on the recipe of the chemistry. They test out new formulas, if you like. And then it goes to the CMCC to standardize this cell production, optimize it, and then collaborate with their suppliers in terms of cost, quality, eco-friendliness. And rather than having their own gigafactories at BMW, they're, they're way of doing it is to collaborate. So they don't want to have their own gigafactories. They don't want to get into the business of owning their own factories. Equally, they don't want to just go to the market and say, what have you got? We'll buy it off the shelf. This is their way of doing it. Fair to say, BMW's had their fair share of false starts in, in making EVs. But from the middle of the decade with the new class batteries, the Gen 6 batteries, this is how they want to do it. The cells then go to BMW's pack assembly units, which they say will be near where the cars are made. Uh, the upcoming models will be they a technical breakthrough, they say. The cells will be 20% uh, more energy dense, 30% faster charging, and offer 30% more range than current technology. Now, BMW partners with Asian manufacturers like CATL in China and Samsung in South Korea. However, it also wants to boost its battery cell sourcing in places like Germany, US, Hungary, and Mexico. For the Neuklas, uh, BMW inked a deal with CATL. They're building a gigafactory in Hungary near to where the BMWs are going to be assembled. The Gen 6 battery pack manufacturing will be escalated at a new plant as well in Lower Bavaria with a capacity of 600,000 batteries per year. Construction begins soon on that, and BMW agreeing with AESC for a gigafactory in South Carolina to support their new battery assembly in Woodruff, adjacent to their Spartanburg assembly plant. And talking batteries, Toyota yesterday admitted that their current spending was nowhere near enough if they want to compete in terms of EVs in the future. Toyota admitting their current EV investment strategy wasn't enough when compared to the rest of the industry, and they announced an additional $8 billion US dollars into their Toyota battery manufacturing North Carolina facility. Now, this infusion brings the total investment to a much more comparable $13.9 billion when you look at their competitors. The funds will bolster capacity for cells for pure BEVs, plug-in hybrids, and yes, their soft hybrids as well. Eight more production lines will be set up for pure electric cars and plug-in electric cars, uh, joining the initial two, as that's 10 lines for the BEVs and the FEVs. The plant will maintain its initially announced four battery lines for soft hybrids. Uh, Toyota's phased production increase will span from now till 2030 and by the end of the decade targeting an annual comp uh, production capacity of 30 gigawatt hours, which is below many of the gigafactories coming online, particularly in, uh, in Asia as well. But don't want to criticise, this is money that they had to spend urgently to get these things, well, just all the plates starting to spin, if you like, because fabulously complicated and a long time frame, as we see from now till 2030, uh, to put these kind of plans in place. Next up, we'll talk Android Auto and a new app from Fastnet. I love the Fastnet network. It just works so well. The tech is great. The hardware is good. I haven't tried this new app yet, though, because I'm an Apple boy. I know I'm totally, yes, the watch and everything. 
However, uh, Android Auto has a new FastNed app dedicated to locating EV charging stations, well, FastNed stations, and then integrating into Google Maps and Waze. FastNed boasts over 1,500 charging stations across Europe, mostly in Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, UK, Brussels as well. But uh, the Android Auto FastNed app will assist you in finding your nearest charging point. Well, why wouldn't you not just use like a third-party app? Well, FastNed say that theirs provides much better insights into pricing, charging availability, well, it should do, it's their app, their network, and other relevant details. Now, FastNet had previously rolled out an app with similar features to Apple's CarPlay, which I also haven't tried, uh, but which both Google Maps and Waze have functionality within. And I, and I do love that because with the best will in the world, uh, Apple, and I am completely in the Apple ecosystem, just not in the ha habit of using Apple Maps since that botched launch. Was that like 10 years ago now? <laughs> Look, the building's looking funny on the map. I just always use Google Maps. I know, I know. They know everything about me, where I go and what I'm doing. But still, fantastic integration to have. Next, we'll talk about green school buses and green power. Now, I must confess, this is not a company that I think I've even talked about on the podcast before, so very, very sorry. Uh, I tend to know about most things going on after 2,000 podcasts every single day. Don't do a daily podcast. If anyone's thinking of doing one, just don't do one. Uh, the green power is who uh, we're talking about. The latest school bus, uh, they've called it the Mega Beast which I think is brilliant. Well, I mean, what should we call the bus? The Mega Beast. And that's because they've got some heritage in using that name, by the way. Uh, double the range compared to its predecessor, which was simply called The Beasts. Now, a single charge provides a range of 300 miles. Isn't that a lot more than a school bus needs? Oh, I suppose, you know, cold temperatures and etc., etc. But either way, 387 kilowatt hour battery pack, which to me does seem lined up for vehicle to grid because school buses have a set route, you know where they're going, you know what's happening with a school bus, you know exactly what route it's going to be on, the energy it needs, and if you've got that much storage and it's going to be parked up during the day when maybe the grid needs it, sell it back, especially in the evenings as well, between 5 and 7 p.m. when the grid gets, in most places, the curve looks different, but in most places, that, kind of, that time of day, uh, it gets uh, really busy. Sell it back overnight, buy it back, and then take the kids to school the next day and do, some, do a bit of uh, arbitrage, I think that's what they call it, uh, on energy trading. The Mega Beast follows its two prior vehicles, as I mentioned, the Nano Beast and the Type D, the original Type D Beast. Uh, they're going to enter production in California and South Charleston uh, come 2024. A couple more stories on the podcast today. If you like what we do, by the way, this is how I earn my living uh, through Patreon. A few ads on the audio podcast and stuff, but otherwise, if you want your podcasts ad free or you just want to support the work that we do, I say we. It's me, really. Um, that I do here, you can check out the Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash evnewsdaily for 5 or $10 a month, like a couple of posh coffees. You can be an exec producer of the show, directly support the work in, in getting the word out there about electric vehicles to fight the fossils and to spread the word about this move to e-mobility. Now, let's talk Porsche incorporating low CO2 steel in their sports cars. You wouldn't hear this story, I reckon, on any other podcast, but it's a really interesting thing that I think would... Uh, pass a lot of people by. Green steel is going to be really, really important. And H2 Green Steel, they're based in Sweden, in Boden, or I suppose it's Sweden, so actually Boden, is set to produce steel using renewable energy starting from the end of 2025. Their steel production method involves hydrogen and renewable electricity, uh, which is almost carbon neutral, 95% reduction in CO2 compared to the traditional coking coal method. It's the thing that no one talks about in making electric vehicles. So many people talk about, well, it's all about, you know, the battery and the lithium ion battery and where you're getting these materials from and mining and the steel in vehicles. You know, the best thing, if you want to be green, the best car to buy is no car at all, let's face it. But I think that's a, that's a bit of a sell to, you know, the world of how do we go green? Well, you've got to give up all of your cars. No one's going to buy that. So let's try and drive electric cars made with green steel. Now, Porsche committing to 35,000 tonnes of this green steel in their car production. That's comparable to about 220,000 tonnes of steel they use in their vehicles in 2022. So it's not everything they need, uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a chunk. And while Porsche is leaning towards aluminium for their lightweighting properties, steel is an important part of crafting sports cars and all cars as well. I remember doing a, a talk on this God, a year or two ago at the Move conference. That was the one in London. And, and, and even then there were some amazing things happening and things have really moved on in that time. Really important that we clean up steel production as well. If you care about those kind of things with electric vehicles, 
because many people like them because they're fast and good performance and, and they're cool. Uh, but if you care about the environmental aspect as well, that's an important story to pay attention to. And finally, can we talk plug-in hybrids with DC fast charging on just for a second? Uh, this new car and driver article that I found, uh, they drove the S-Class, uh, but the plug-in version of the S-Class. It's a turbocharged 3-litre engine, but with the electric motor stuff. And another Mercedes-Benz hitting the market with DC fast charging. Now, it is DC fast charging. I'll get onto that. Impressively, it managed 58 miles in the car and driver test at 75 miles an hour. EPA range 46 miles, so it exceeded that really well. Mercedes will put 60 kilowatt DC fast charging on. It's an upgrade of only $500. The battery is 22.7 kilowatt hours, and you can get to 80% charge on that in just 20 minutes. Now, taking into account faster charging and other enhancements, uh, that model that the car and driver tested was brace yourself, $140,000. So now I'm not talking about this vehicle as making a big impact in generally in the world of EVs, but it's an increasing trend, particularly on premium vehicles, Mercedes-Benz, of putting CCS1, and I presume soon in North America, NAX, on the side of their plug-in hybrids. I thought it was an interesting debate. Would like to know your thoughts. Uh, let me know. Uh, if you turned up to the limited... DC fast charging infrastructure, and you found a plug-in hybrid on it, how would you feel about it? Look, it charges at 60 kilowatts, which is decent. and it ho It's a great charge curve as well. It holds it really well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know how many EV drivers would feel when it, the charger is blocked, got limited infrastructure, at least for the foreseeable future. And you're like, dude, you've got an engine. Don't block the chargers. But equally, if you buy a car with that socket on the side, Aren't you entitled as much as anybody else to charge? You can be considerate and move on. But still, interesting debate. I'd love to know your thoughts on it. Thank you so much for watching the video today. Still getting the hang of getting it right. And I think I think we're into a pretty good flow uh, with it. But let me know if we can make this show even better. And I'll listen to your comments. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for subscribing. And if you haven't, then you don't have to. But if you want this in your feed, then... It's down there somewhere. I'll try and point to it. I'll probably get it wrong. And, oh, if you hit like, the thumbs up, uh, it does nothing else, but it helps the YouTube algorithm. But if you like this video, it tells me that you liked it and that I'll do more just like this. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for liking. I'll catch you on the next one. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.